Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 84 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Lauren Tessier, and the topic of the show is life after mold. Dr. Lauren Tessier is a naturopathic physician licensed in the state of Vermont. She received her bachelor's in pre-medical sciences and health psychology from Massachusetts College of Pharmacy in Boston, and later became a naturopathic physician at Bastyr University in Kenmore, Washington. Her practice, Life After Mold, uses a patient-centered approach to help recover those that are suffering from mold-related illness. She combines naturopathic, functional, and integrative medicine to address the entire person. She is a Shoemaker-certified physician specializing in the treatment of chronic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, which results from exposure to water-damaged buildings. In 2011, Hurricane Irene created an unimaginable flood in Waterbury, Vermont, and she was unprepared for what she would see next in her practice. Patients were ill with unexplained rashes, allergies that did not respond to treatment, fatigue, breathing difficulties, neurological complaints, headaches, nausea, and immune system dysfunction. When her normal approaches no longer worked for these patients, she dove deep into mold-related illness. Her practice is dedicated to helping those suffering with mold, biotoxin, and mycotoxin-associated illness resulting from water-damaged buildings. As time passed, she came to the belief that the environment plays a role in all chronic illness. Environmental illness includes mold, heavy metals, glyphosate exposure, chronic infections such as Lyme disease, multiple chemical sensitivity, and mast cell activation syndrome. Dr. Tessier is an executive board member for the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, or ICI, which aims to advance medical knowledge surrounding environmentally acquired illness. And now, my interview with Dr. Lauren Tessier. Mold illness is one of the things that really is an important topic for me to discuss and to really share with people. Mold was a big part of my own personal journey. And so my observation has been that people dealing with long-term chronic Lyme disease, unresponsive to treatment, often have an ongoing mold exposure. And so I'm excited today to have Dr. Lauren here to talk with us about life after mold. Thanks for being here today, Dr. Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Thanks. So what series of events led you to focusing your work as a naturopathic doctor on mold illness? How did you end up doing the work that you're doing today? And was there some personal connection for you? Sure. So that's a great question. Um, In general, well, there's two different ways that people become motivated by the work they do. They have the things that get you started, and then you have the things that continually motivate you. What got me started was coming essentially to a flood recovery area um, from Hurricane Irina here in Waterbury, Vermont, and, you know, lots of sick people. And it's any client, any uh, clinician's due diligence to go and research and learn and try to figure out what's happening. Um, So that's what got me started. But what has actually kept me motivated um, actually results from a loss, a familial loss, Um, When I was in my early teens, um, my favorite uncle in the world, um, loud, gregarious, just kind and funny, (laughs) just all around wonderful person, uh, we lost him to uh, Wegner's granulomatosis. And um, in general, it's a pretty well-known disease. And, you know, you see certain testing parameters, ANA, uh, CA positive, ANCA positive, and uh, vasculitis issues. The curious part about his struggle was that it took a hospital six weeks, um, day in and day out, to diagnose Wegner's, which should have been a very straightforward diagnosis. And in going in to his home and helping kind of get it ready for him to come back out of the hospital, um, my mother and I noticed that there was a, a good amount of mold in his home. So as time marched on, 
you know, we eventually lost him. He went in and out of remission and in and out of the hospital, but ultimately returned to that space and then eventually succumbed in that space. So as time kind of marched forward, I had this puzzle piece, this like mold puzzle piece and this scratching of my head, even as a teen of, you know, these were doctors. It shouldn't have taken them six weeks to, to figure this out. So um, it's always been in the back of my head. So going through med school, I did projects on Wegner's and all this kind of stuff. And it wasn't until really a few years ago when I started working with mold that I remembered there was mold in his space. So I'm not specifically saying that Wegner's granulomatosis is caused by mold. I want to be completely clear of that to your audience, right? But what I, I do know is that, you know, mold alters the immune system functioning. And we do see a lot of autoimmune-like conditions in people suffering from mold or nondescript. And, you know, that's, that's my motivator. I know I can't bring back someone I lost, but if I can just prevent someone else from losing a loved one like that or prevent someone from suffering that much, that's really a go-to. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a sad motivation, but it's, yeah. it's, um, yeah. So. I guess the good thing is in his honor, you're able to now help a lot of other people with the information that you put together as a result of his own condition. So that's, um, uh, it, it's a sad, sad situation, but it's good that you're doing such positive things with it now. Right. And we know mold makes people very sick and, you know, you see it, we see it day in and day out. So um, I'm just thankful for him and I'm thankful for the work I'm able to do because I'm inspired by him. Let's start with some of the environmental factors that might predispose an environment to mold. So we know that mold illness generally the result of exposure to a water damaged building. What are some of the things that create the right conditions for mold to grow in an environment? And what are some of the common sources of water damage that you see in your clinical practice? Sure. So humidity, obviously the big three, humidity, some type of cellulose or organic matter, and in general, an undisturbed environment. So those three go together really, really well for uh, production of mold. Since I'm in uh, the New England area, a lot of our water damage issues surrounds um, a lot of cold, coldness just because of our climate. So in general, we'll have a lot of um, ice damming issues for folks in the winter where, you know, maybe their gutters weren't thoroughly cleaned or they'll have a bathroom vent that's pumping out hot air and causing the snow to kind of melt and then ice dam. Um, and then we get water intrusion that way. Um, the freeze and thaw, cracking of foundations and basements. Um, a lot of us up here have French drains that empty our basements kind of down under our house and out towards a, a water exit. And um, those can have a lot of issues and of course, a lot of sub pump issues. And in general, because we have these seasons that we have to answer to up here, um, we have a lot of humidity in homes. I think that really goes unappreciated or underappreciated. People think of the South as very humid, but you know, it gets very humid up here in Vermont. And what adds to that is, a lot of us are on wells, and so we get these cold water inlines that are coming from a deep well, and then we get these reservoir of water that just sit in pipes, in toilet tanks, and then because of the temperature gradient difference, we get tons of condensation um, with regards to that. And then, of course, a lot of these houses are older up here, so um, weak vents in bathrooms. You know, just because you have a vent doesn't mean it's pulling that column of air as well as it should. Um, and then a lot of retrofitted tubs, people do this whole like facelift when they go to put a uh, house on the market, but retrofitted tubs that have that um, ability to kind of um, expand and contract. Mm -hmm. And when they do it is able to pull water up and behind. So those have been, you know, some of the bigger ways with my clients that I've seen water intrusion happen up here. How important is it for people to do regular cleaning of their environment to kind of minimize the potential for mold over time becoming an issue? And then are there certain things that you recommend to kind of optimally clean the home environment? Sure. So I don't expect people to be Mr. and Mrs. Susie Homemaker when it comes to their home. I tell people do the best that you can because we're also dealing with folks who are very sick who have trouble getting around and you can't always ask them to have someone come in and clean for them um, just because of financial limitations or chemicals that that company uses. So 
I remind people that the most important thing about cleaning is clearing dust and debris and also perturbing the area. So the more that you wipe a cloth over an area or do a pass by, the more, um, or excuse me, the less likely it is that mold is going to grow in that area. And then I ask people to try to do as eco-friendly and clean as they can. But of course, I have a lot of folks where, you know, they can't do some of the more um, ecological cleaners. So sometimes we go back to basics with, you know, vinegar and water as their cleaning solution to, to just wipe things up for maintenance. So you mentioned humidity earlier. Is there a certain level of humidity that potentially is a problem? And at what point do you then recommend people get a dehumidifier? Right. So here, just because I get very concerned about it. Um, I have people maintain their humidity no higher than 35 to 40 percent, oh. which, well, it's, we have a lot of humidity here and it's, it varies from climate to climate. So if I were in Arizona and um, I might not have that same um, humidity request. So because of the climate I'm in, I'm asked people to maintain a humidity no higher than 35 to 40. And that can be problematic because we know that these humidifiers, I've seen humidifiers from the early 2000s that will increase an electric bill by about 200 a month. So it's imperative when we tell people these things, always go with an energy efficient dehumidifier. Buy new, get something new. And um, for some people who you know, might have trouble keeping a reservoir clean or who don't trust the hose pump on these dehumidifiers, using um, or getting a hybrid hot water heater. Are you familiar with these at all? All right. So uh, the hybrid hot water heaters are phenomenal. So they use ambient air. They pull it in almost like through a reverse refrigeration process. And they use the temperature of the ambient air to heat, preheat the water. So there's lower hot water costs. But when they preheat using the ambient air, they pull all the humidity out and it drains into the main line of your plumbing system. So I've found that hybrid hot water heater can save money for folks, but it can also really, I think it removes anywhere from five, one to five gallons of water per day from its surroundings just out of the ambient air. Wow. Uh, crawl spaces and basements, those are two common issues that people have in their home that can lead to mold mm -hmm. problems. What are the best ways to kind of mitigate that issue or minimize that becoming a problem later? Sure. So I think every type of foundation has its pros and cons. Even slabs have their pros and cons. Um, I think being really comfortable with your home and understanding its character and what is there to work with or not work with from the get-go. So I have people in general for either of those, pay attention to the structural integrity, insulate your pipes, you know, maybe bring in an IEP to get a thermal imaging device so you can see where there's discrepancies in hot versus cold because that causes humidity issues um, for pretty much either of these spaces because of the chimney effect. There might be some utility to having um, a negative air pressure maintained in there by using some type of a forced ventilation. Um, every now and then you'll see people who will want to completely seal their crawl space shut, but we have seen pooling of water from just humidity in general cause you know, uh, stagnant water under people's homes. So that's a concern specifically for the crawl spaces. But when you are working on trying to optimize a crawl space in general, they say about six mil should be the thickness on the vapor barrier. So that's a cover that we put on the inside, um, but it can go up to 20 mils. But I remind people when you have someone doing this installation, um, installation for you, do not have them use the metal fasteners because once you put a hole through the vapor barrier, you're going to allow for intrusion. So we always remind people, be cautious about puncturing that and um, potentially use some type of um, adhesive to Excellent. install those. Excellent. Let's talk a little about ventilation and airflow. I know in your ebook that I think people should definitely go check out on the website, lifeaftermold.com. Lots of good information. That's part of what we're covering here. Um, so talk about ventilation and airflow. How important is it? Should people have windows open, closed? What do you recommend? Sure. So in general, um, I think everyone more or less in the mold community now knows the story. The 1970s and the fuel crisis really pushed for um, tightness in homes. That way we weren't wasting on much on healing, including costs, cooling costs. And because of that, you know, we're trapping molds, chemicals, contaminants, 
VOCs, construction materials into these homes. And that's really where the concept of the sick, sick building syndrome started. So in general, what we find is with improving ventilation, sometimes doing like a forced air exchange in a space, um, you're going to bring in cleaner air and you're going to push out dirtier air. But, you know, you should really be speaking to a specialist that's nearby, that's familiar with the climate and familiar with the ins and outs of your homes to best make those suggestions. And when it comes to opening windows and things like that, I remind people, if you live near streams, if you live near ponds or water, opening windows is going to invite in humidity. And because, especially if you're living near stagnant water, you might be inviting in spores from the out of doors. Um, I don't try to scare people <laughs> with regards to that. We all love fresh air. And I'd much rather have you have windows open and have fresh air than um, thinking you're doing yourself well by sealing yourself into a non-ventilated home. Let's talk a little about some of the air filtration or purification systems that are available. Are there certain ones that you found helpful with your patients? Sure. So there have been studies around HEPA filters. When they first were created, they were based off of using inorganic matter. So specifically using salt, like a salt spray to see how well these filters caught um, this matter and trapped it. We know from studies that have followed that, that our organic matter, our growing matter, behaves differently than an inert, non-organic matter. So um, trying to extrapolate what a HEPA filter is doing to filter your environment to something that's living and, you know, always in flux is, is very difficult. Um, what I have seen with HEPA filters, if you don't change them often or clean them often. And if you have a high enough percentage of humidity, they can end up growing. Mold. And the problem with that is the hyphae um, and the, excuse me, the filaments can kind of crawl through the filter, mm -hmm. get to the other side of the filter, break off, and then you're spitting mold back into your home. So there is something to be said for the benefits of air purification in addition to filtration. There's uh, photocatalytic processes out there right now, but they tend to create ozone and they tend to create um, hydroxyl free radicals. Um, there's a new technology out called uh, photoelectrocatalysis. And can is it okay if I mention specific Absolutely. company? Yeah. Okay, so um, this has been created by Molecule and Molecule's a new kid on the block. I love their product and I actually just recently met the um, CEO and it's a family company, turns out, that was motivated by their own health issues. So, you know, when I see something that works, that doesn't produce ozone at all, that doesn't produce hydroxyl-free radicals, and that comes from, you know, really good family of people um, with good intentions, I get behind that really fast. So, um, in general, that's really what I suggest for people. But first and foremost, remediation is always, always key. So let's talk then a little bit about when we think of water damaged buildings, we generally are thinking of mold and mycotoxins. What are some of the other substances? You mentioned VOCs, but what are some of the substances we might encounter in a water damaged building? And are mycotoxins a big part of the problem, a small part of the problem? What's your perspective on that? Sure. I think that, um, you know, when we're dealing with water damaged buildings, there's a lot that can grow in there. We essentially have a nice big juicy petri dish. So we have everything from, you know, um, protozoa that can grow in there, types of chlamydia, um, mycoplasma even. We see marcons can be a source in water damaged buildings. And then, of course, we have kind of all of the, the non-living things. So, of course, mycotoxins, VOCs, um, and, but tiny little fine and ultra fine and nanoparticulates that can really wreak havoc on the system. So um, a lot of things that can exist in a water damaged space. I'm sure the answer here is going to be quite lengthy, but what are some of the <laughs> symptoms? Maybe what are some of the common symptoms or some of the real clues for you when someone comes in that you kind of go, ah, there's potentially a mold issue here? Sure. So in general, the nice part about the life after mold practice is people are usually coming to me because they know they have a defined mold space. So, um, you know, it, that's kind of already set ahead for me. But when I was working with my, my primary care group, you know, we would have a lot of people come in with brain fog, fatigue, um, depression, mood swings, myalgia, so muscle pain, soreness, um, 
cognitive complaints, so brain fog or can't focus or can't remember, can't recall, and definitely disturbed sleep. Those tend to be not only the biggest when I was kind of blind to what was actually going on, but also currently the biggest in the mold practice itself. So if someone's looking to do a basic screening test in their home environment, what do you generally recommend? Do you find the ERMI helpful? I mean, there are those people that aren't quite ready to invest in an IEP or indoor environmental professional. So what can they do to try to, as much as possible, rule out the potential for being in an environment that's really not supporting their healing? Sure. So, you know, I... People, some people might not want to jump on an IEP right away. And I know that some people are also scared of finding the wrong one or one that might not meet their needs. And um, I actually will be working on a document soon that will help people kind of navigate questionnaires that they can ask IEPs or remediators to see if they're really worth hiring. So that will be soon to come, probably closer to the holidays. But in general, I remind people it's almost like an annual report card, almost like going to your your physician for your preventative wellness. It is your home. This is where you live. You should know the ins and outs of your home. So paying attention to temperature gradients or checking humidity or checking for shadowing on the walls, um, seeing if you can see any nails kind of raising or pushing through, checking for seams and drywall, um, looking for water staining, and of course, seeing how you feel in your own environment. So if all of a sudden the kitchen has been bothering you over the past few months and it never was an issue before, then you know it's really maybe time to investigate. So you can also um, hire an IEP once to come in and have you do that walkthrough with you. So then you can grade on yourself afterwards to see what's happening in the home. Um, one of my, my favorite tricks that uh, Dr. Sonia Rappaport, the president of ICI, speaks about is doing a um, camera test. So, you know, getting your smartphone or whatever it may be and taking a flashed picture of surfaces and seeing if there's any kind of dewy or fuzzy presentation on it. And usually that's a nice sign that there there could be mold growing there. And that's the the mycelium that's really fine and hard to see. So when we think mold, we think black, brown, big, and obvious. But there's a lot of kind of white, powdery mycelium that we might miss. And so um, I always appreciated that little tip that she had for us. And do you find that your patients find the ERMI testing helpful or not generally? That was a good question. <laughs> so the the ERMI, the ERMI helps me understand what's happening in a home and what the biggest threats are in a home. They help me navigate treatment and they allow me to understand whether or not the space is safer. Mm-hmm. We can never tell if the space is 100% safe due to sampling errors and all that kind of stuff. We also know that there's more than just those um, however many 30 or so um, mold species existing in a home. So we also don't know what other bugs are existing in a home that are degrading the benzene products from us painting walls. So when it comes to mold and mycotoxins surrounding those specific species, yes, it is helpful. But when it comes to that generalized sick building syndrome and we've remediated and it's been pretty thorough and all our repairs are done, there are times when the ERMI leaves us wanting. Perfect. Let's talk a little about the genetic predisposition to biotoxin illness. So people may know HLA-DR. So how important is one's HLA-DR status, both in terms of the potential for developing a biotoxin illness, but then also from your perspective, in terms of their capacity or potential for recovering from that condition. So um, I know a lot of people maybe lose hope when they see their results. And so should we lose hope if we have these biotoxin illness supporting genetics? Sure. So when we think of the haplotypes, there's a standard theory that if you have them, you're not going to get better. And um, I have seen plenty of people, let me step back, When I think about mold illness or when I speak about mold illness, we think of mold allergy, we think of mycotoxicosis, and then we think of SEERS, which is the um, the, uh, inflammatory development from the exposure. It's like the fire after the gasoline has been put on the pile of wood. So there's a few different things I'm talking about when I look for illness with people, including those other two issues. 
when we're talking about those haplotypes, those HLA, yada, yada, yadas, those are um, specific for SIRS. But there have been plenty of times when I have had people come in that will have the elevated SIRS markers that do not have the haplotypes that are very sick people. There have been plenty of times where I've had people come in and it pretty much looks like more of a mold illness, pre, uh, excuse me, a mold allergy presentation. And they have the haplotypes and they are negative for their serous inflammatory markers. So I'm not clear 100% about it. In general, I never expect people or tell people to lose hope because of something. And we also have to keep in mind that you're upright, you're alive, you're walking, you've made it to this day. There's something there in your DNA, in your genetics that's supporting you. And to really just focus on the impact of a few genes is problematic for me because we know the field of epigenetics. We know that we have SNPs. We know that people have the ability to turn on and turn off detox and turn on and turn off inflammatory markers. So what I'm getting at is even if you do have the HLA stuff going on, there is the ability to help you with other things in support of certain SNPs that you may have. I agree. And I think it's, you know, one of the messages I've tried to get across is that your genes don't tell your story. They're not your destiny. I'm a 4353 from an HLA perspective, and I'm doing really, really well and have done really well with my treatment. I think a lot of it comes down to looking really broadly and holistically, which you as a naturopath, I know that's one of the skills that naturopathic doctors have. So I don't think that people should look at their HLA DR results and feel like that's um, the cards being stacked against them because lots of people that have the more complex HLA results definitely recover with appropriate treatment. Would you agree with that? Right. And then what happens with your, your fear reaction to your health? You know, we, we know that so many people with mycotoxin illness do their, their key component that they end up finishing with is like DNSR or limbic system retraining. And so we're going to get them fearful from the get go. I just, right. I don't understand that. So we talked a little about ways to test your environment. So are there ways to explore the person for the possibility of mold illness? So we certainly can look at mold allergy. You talked about that a little. We can do blood tests to see if someone has mold allergy. But can we look at, let's say, the urine mycotoxin testing? Are there, is there value in looking at what's coming out in the urine as an indicator of the potential for exposure to water damaged buildings and mold? What are your thoughts on the urine mycotoxin tests that are emerging? Sure. So my big disclaimer before this question is we need to test both the environment and the human to, so we know that, so that we know that there's not an ongoing exposure happening that we can't correct. So I think that the mycotoxin test is great when we are seeing some type of mycotoxicosis in a case. And like I said, when we're talking about Sears, Sears is the fire that has happened after we've poured the gas on the bonfire. And the gas in this case is the mycotoxin. So the fire can keep going after the mycotoxins are completely out. So I find that there is some clinical utility for mycotoxin testing in that maybe it allows us to know how much longer to have someone on a binder or, um, you know, uh, kind of even where exposure is coming from. So maybe we see chaetomium mycotoxin elevation in the urine, and then we see it positive on the ERMI. We can bring some correlation into that space. There are specific mycotoxin tests that seem to test food more than environment. And um, that can be kind of confusing and problematic. And the reason why is we know that the respiratory system has the highest predilection towards absorbing mycotoxins compared to the gut. Um, that's actually cited, I believe, in a, a, a great research article by Dr. Jeanette Hope, if people want to go and look that up. So mycotoxin testing is great. There is some issues with exposure coming from food. And I think it's very important that people use the right mycotoxin test to look at the environmental impact. Is there a particular one that you're using clinically? I find that the real-time testing is uh, more supportive of an environmental check. Although some people have qualms against um, how one test with GPL versus real-time labs is run, um, but I appreciate more so what they're testing rather than their methodology. 
Beautiful. So when we talk about mycotoxins, um, there's also some debate about if you have ongoing mycotoxins coming out in the urine, for example, is it an ongoing exposure or is it possible that from long-term exposure to water damaged buildings that maybe we become colonized in our sinuses, in our gut with these organisms, we move to an environment that's completely safe, no ongoing mold exposure, and yet maybe we have this mycotoxin factory, so to speak, inside of us. So what are your thoughts on that? Is there a potential Potential for colonization of these environmental exposures? Sure. So I come from two different schools of thought. As a shoemaker certified physician, we are trained to understand AW content. So that's how much water a tissue is able to hold or a space holds. And supposedly, a lot of these uh, molds that we're interacting with in the environment cannot grow in the sinuses because it doesn't have a high enough AW content, doesn't have a high enough moisture content. However, also in the literature, we know that um, immunocompromised people can develop fungal infections. And we know that because of all the HIV and AIDS literature. And we also know that mycotoxins and mold exposure can cause a weakened immune system and cause a suppression of immune system. We see that in SIRS with a low T reg count. So I'm starting to dig more and more into the concept of um, uh, medical mycology and doing more digging around the different infections that can occur. Have I sat down and specifically looked to see if a urine mycotoxin test is indicative of an Aspergillus niger? infection? No, not yet. It's on, it's on my to-do list. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we also need to think about in our traditional um, form of medicine, there's still not a lot of clarity between an infection and a colonization. I can swab your nose and see, you know, maybe a growth of some type of Aspergillus species um, come out, but I'm not clear if that's because you inhaled a valuable sample or if there is mm -hmm. an active infection in there. So, in tradition with Western Med, in order to um, safely order someone a, a sinus antifungal, they need to have an MRI run, they need to have fungal balls found in the sinuses, or else you'll never get insurance to ever consider running around of nasal antifungals. Um, do I think that doing an MRI and doing that is um, absolutely necessary? Not always. I think that sometimes there is a diagnosis of exclusion where you've tried the antibiotics, you've tried the steroids, you've tried everything, but yet we have a chronic sinusitis. So I guess what I'm saying is there may be a use for antifungals, but they need to be navigated cautiously because they're very strong. A lot of them can cause a lot of issues with the liver, can cause a lot of issues with our MCS folks. And, you know, Evidence is required for treatment, but evidence can also um, be a diagnosis of exclusion, if that makes sense. Perfect. That's good. So let's talk then a little bit about how important it is to remove the source of the exposure in someone that has mold illness. And when you have your patients looking at their home environment, do you generally find that remediation is enough for them to then move their health forward, or do they more commonly need to move to a completely different environment? I'm always very cautious about this conversation. The one thing that I want to make sure that I don't do is turn someone's home, their most important thing in their life potentially, into the enemy. That is just one of the most heartbreaking things I think that you can do to someone. However, there also needs to be thorough education for folks in regards to this. I usually breathe a sigh of relief if someone lives in an apartment where they're able to kind of get up and move. I get a little bit more cautious about navigating this conversation when someone actually physically is invested in a space and owns a home. <clears throat> in general, we need to have you avoid. It's imperative. You know, um, people do get sick from mycotoxins and it doesn't have to be SIRS. It's a toxin coming into your system. So eventually even the healthiest person is going to get sick. So remediation is imperative. But what is maybe the most important with remediation is making sure repair happens. There have been so many times I've seen people have remediation occur, but then their remediation company doesn't have a dialogue with them about, you know, maybe you should hire someone to fix the shingles that are missing around the chimney flashing. 
So, you know, and just because someone has a good remediation doesn't mean that the air is clean in there afterwards. Sometimes we need to bring in air scrubbers. We need to clean up some of the chemicals that might be setting people off. So, um, you know, remediation, a just kind of base level remediation typically doesn't cut it. But when it's gone through and your time is taken and you also give your time between remediation repair, maybe a couple of rain cycles to see if there's any water intrusion, really cover cover everything and make sure that, you know, it's a thorough remediation and take your time with it. That's usually when I see patients improve with avoidance. You mentioned binders a little bit earlier. So let's talk a little about the concept of binders, the idea of absorption versus adsorption, why we take them, some of your personal favorites maybe, and then what guidance do you give your patients in terms of how far away from food supplements and medications the binders need to be taken? Sure. So with our binders, um, the reason why they're so important is because they help catch our bile, which our toxins ride out on. And typically we lose about 500 milligrams of bile through the feces a day, but we get about 95 to 90% of our bile acids recycled through about six to eight cycles per day. So what ends up happening is we have about 9,500 milligrams of bile and their toxins going back into circulation over and over again. So if we don't have a binder going through the GI to hold on to that and kind of pull it out through the gut and get rid of it, you know, you're just gonna keep having exposure. So when we're using binders, we're using them for their adsorbative versus absorption quality. When you're working with adsorption, I equate it to almost having um, broken up styrofoam kind of clinging to the fingers. There's a clinging surface effect rather than a, a um, kind of a soluble, soluble effect of it. So some of my personal favorites have, have been CSM because, you know, it's, it's very strong. But as I have more and more sick clients coming to me who, you know, can only take maybe a half a gram every two days without having a flare, um, I've come to really look at a lot of the other binders that exist out there. Um, I tend to like charcoal, of course, right? Um, clay, I get a little bit more nervous around just because of heavy metal issues. And it's not uncommon for um, people to use binders maybe a little bit too aggressively and throw out their electrolyte in their um, blood. So I, I'm very cautious about it. And so charcoal is probably my second favorite. Well call is very gentle, but I find that it's very expensive for folks, but it's much better tolerated than CSM. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of uh, great combo products that exist out there that folks use. So when we're using binders, I ask people to typically um, keep all meds and supplements, especially if it's a supplement, a med you depend on to like regulate your blood pressure or it's a psych med to help keep you from being too depressed or something you depend on you need to make sure that your meds are being taken away from your binders and specifically I say two hours so we do binders 30 minutes fat containing meal um, and then we do after that two hours for supplements and meds and then for some folks who get really concerned about timing and setting clocks and you know some of it can be a really big pain um, if anyone goes to the bathroom in the middle of the night um, sometimes I'll suggest putting like maybe their thyroid medication with a glass of water so when they go to use the bathroom they take it and they have that kind of um, dosage that doesn't have to compete with the rest of the things during the day yeah, I think that's great. And I've actually done the opposite too, which is to take the binder in the middle of the night so that at least you got one dose of the binder in while you're, you know, not taking other medications. So that's great. You now, know, what binder were you using for that out of curiosity? Because I bet you it wasn't CSM. In the middle no, it, wasn't. Of the night. it wasn't. It was a more natural charcoal type binder at the time. Yeah. You know, and my, my observation with people, unfortunately, the binders, I think, are probably one of the most important things that people are consistent about. And it's kind of the first thing that they seem to become 
non-compliant with and not really able to do because of all this scheduling. But I definitely encourage people to, you know, make sure that you're able to fit those in and work with your practitioner about timing and so on, because they really are important. So let's go a little further with the topic of binders. If we talk about, you talked about bile and that I like the way you said toxins ride out on the bile. So how important is it for us to also focus on optimizing bile flow? If we're not getting the toxins from the liver into the bile, into the gallbladder and into the gut, but are we potentially not getting the most effective use of those binders because there, there aren't toxins there for them to bind to essentially? Right. And so that's, that's a really a, a great point. In general, um, how I have people keep their, their bile moving is making sure that they are on phosphatidylcholine, which also, while we're at it, is a great um, maintainer of the cell membrane and helps with cell communication. So that's a win-win. And I remind people, anything that helps stimulate GGT, so GGT is this little signaler that when we put fat-containing food and uh, protein-containing food into our stomachs, you have this little signal that essentially tells our gallbladder to squirt out bile. So anything that helps to stimulate GGT is going to be great too. And we're looking at amino acids and fat. So just based off that alone, I do suggest that people be on something similar to the keto diet if their con um, constitution is able to tolerate it. Um, you know, in addition to the benefits of the keto diet with specifically our, um, GGT stimulation, we also have a neuroprotective effect. We potentially might even uh, help to mitigate low levels of VEGF, which I'm really excited about because VEGF can be really hard to um, shift in Sears folks. Um, and we also know that it helps with hormones. It gets enough cholesterol into the body. Um, and we know that when people are on binders for too long, we lose cholesterol and we can mess with the um, the hormonal system too much. And then we also get a good amount of fat soluble vitamins in there too. Um, so I'm a big proponent in the keto diet because there's lots of info out there about it. Um, but you know, the big thing is that it really helps stimulate the GGT and it also meets the needs of the low, no amylose diet. Um, that's traditional of the SERS protocol. Um, the other thing that I find is really important is understanding the impacts of NRF2 and MPK2 on the bile and the ability to detox. Um, NRF2 hangs out in the cytosol. When it hits oxidative stress, it cleaves, it goes into the nucleus, and then we code for something called MPK2. MPK2 acts kind of as a little shuttle, a little exit point between the liver cell and the bile caniculi. And so when NRF2 is stimulated, we have this big open, beautiful shuttle that helps move our bile acids and our toxins out. But one of the interesting things about mycotoxins is that it inhibits NRF2. And when we inhibit NRF2, we're going to take that nice open shuttle and we're actually going to move it to the other side where the blood enters into the liver cells. So by means to protect the liver, we're going to be kicking our mycotoxins back out into circulation and will essentially affect the kidneys. So, you know, it's great to have high fat meals for bile flow and phosphatidylcholine, but we also need to make sure during all this, we're protecting NRF2 and we're also protecting the kidneys. I, I think that's such an important piece for people to really hear. And I just, it's really probably within the last year, maybe one of the most important things that I didn't really understand before and got out of conversations with Chris Shade and Dr. Kelly Halderman, mm -hmm. the idea that if you're not getting your toxins from the liver into the bile, into the gallbladder, into the gut, that you're pushing them back into the blood. And sometimes what we might feel is a Herxheimer reaction or a detox reaction might be that we're moving those toxins into the blood, essentially, right? Kind of dumping them back into the blood and then potentially reacting to them being there. Right. And there are times too where I'll put someone on a binder and we'll start to get um, right upper quadrant discomfort and pain. And when this first started for me, I couldn't, you know, I was like, well, maybe we're pulling too hard and, you know, what's, what's going on here? And, um, you know, it really came together for me once I learned about NRF2 and MPK2 that we're causing essentially liver stagnation and it would make sense that we would have some right upper quadrant pain with that. What are your thoughts on using bitters for helping to keep the bile and gallbladder system working better? I, I love bitters. I'm a naturopath. I can't help but love bitters. <laughs> so. All right, great. 
You mentioned there are some potential downsides with some of the binders. So are there certain things that you monitor in patients? Are there any risks of long-term use of some of the binders that you've seen clinically? Yeah. So once again, going back to that um, cholesterol balance, and that can be problematic uh, downstream because we know cholesterol leads to pregnenolone and then eventually trickles down to our um, progesterone, our estrogen, our uh, testosterone, essentially anything that has that steroid backbone. So um, always making sure that the cholesterol is actually at a high enough level for folks is important. Um, once again, watching out for your fat soluble vitamins and repleting if necessary, and also watching out for trace minerals because binders are um, indiscriminate with what they grab onto um, and that it can include your minerals in your body. So. so let's talk then a little more on detoxification. We've talked about binders, but now let's talk maybe about drainage remedies, organ support. Talk to us about how you support liver, kidneys, lymph, extracellular matrix, colon, skin, all of these ways or routes of elimination um, in the body. So what are some of the things that you might use? Are there certain foods or herbs or supplements, drainage remedies? What do you like in practice? Sure. So there, there are definitely um, times where I won't even touch detox or binders with people yet until we've worked on what we call opening up the emunctories, big fancy word for your drainage, your drainage systems. Um, you know, and sometimes we have to even work backwards where we say, okay, let's take care of the gut. And then let's take care of the liver. And then <laughs> you can end up going backstream through systems through all the points of entry. Um, in general, really easy take homes for people. Um, liver, you want sulfur rich foods. I tell people if it stinks, it's going to be good for you. Unless you're one of those folks that has a, um, sulfonotransferase issue, then, you know, usually those folks know who they are. Um, but you know, sulfur rich foods, eggs, brassicas, garlics, onion, those are going to be great. And then of course, all the thistles for people, the milk thistles, the artichokes, gentle bitters are great for the liver stimulation. Um, and of course, turmeric is just always there and ever present with the kidneys because of that um, NRF2, MPK2 kind of kickback to livni kidney toxification. I do push people for CoQ10. And um, CoQ10, I want people on upwards of about 400 milligrams per day. Um, some people have issues with the fermentation aspect of CoQ10. So you might have to dig around for a product that works best for you. But we definitely want to make sure that we're protecting the kidneys. Um, and then, of course, there's wonderful nutrient herbs for that, like horsetail and dandelion and parsley. But there might even be a whole nother level of energetic conversation that you have to have with the body before you can do that. And that centers around your drainage remedies for folks. And if you're working with a provider who's familiar with them, they can actually pinpoint and tailor different drainage remedies specific to what your clinical picture is happening. They're almost like a uh, homeopathic detox for folks. And when you talk about drainage remedies, are those things like the Pecana products? Are there specific ones that you use in practice? I find that the, the Pecana ones are really simple and straightforward. There's three that you end up using for like the liver, kidney, gallbladder combo. When you start playing around with um, the UNDA numbers, you can get a little bit more creative in what you're specifically using for people. Beautiful. So we know that SIRS is primarily centered around inflammation that's ongoing. We look at markers like TGF beta one and C4A, MMP9 to kind of understand how much inflammation might be present in someone. So can you talk a little bit about those markers, how clinically useful they are, and then what are some of the things that you might recommend to kind of quell the fire? of inflammation? Right. So for me, the markers that I have found to be the most helpful when I'm working with the altered immune system functioning is really going to be um, the TGF beta and um, the MMP9. And then when we're dealing with um, oxidative stress, um, I think a good amount of the VEGF being something that's more impactful. C3A and C4A, there's a lot of issues around uh, proper specimen handling and getting them to the appropriate labs right now. So C3A and C4A, is um, it's difficult to get a good litmus test on is what I'll say. So, you know, there, there are some considerations where I will use them, um, but I've had people who have Lyme before that C3A, C4A, they don't really light up or do too much in these folks. So um, TGF beta, MMP9, and VEGF are really the big ones that I, I fall back on and I look at a lot. 
now as a naturopath, you know, I've hit my head on the wall numerous times when I've tried using different uh, off-label uses for drugs to address these labs. And I know I have a lot of great tools in my toolbox. So um, things like curcumin can help address TGF-beta, MMP9, and even IL-6, which is something that we draw to measure uh, neuroinflammation. Um, EGCG, which is an extract of green tea, um, once again, will help with our MMP9, IL-6, and also our Tregs, which kind of help keep the immune system in line. And our Tregs tend to fall off when our TGF-beta is high. So anything that's going to help with that, I tend to use a lot. Um, and then... There's a couple of other ones that um, how about I really C- how about prefer. CBD? Do you use CBD for neuroinflammation? CBD. <laughs> I, I do like CBD for neuroinflammation. Once again, that's hitting on MMP9. And the cool part about CBD is it actually works around the pathogenic T-cells. So I know I'm using TGF-beta and T-cells and all these words a lot, but the big take-home is pathogenic T-cells suppress your Tregs, which are helpful. And then as a result, your TGF beta goes up. So if you can do something where you're lowering your TGF beta and you're lowering those pathogenic T cells, you are doing great things for your immune system. So, you know, CBD, a lot of folks will use also for nerve, uh, the neuroinflammation and also some of the anxiety that comes up. And then one of the other ones I love that's more of a pharmaceutical, of course, is our LDN um, because it helps with the IL-6 again for that immune system activation or the um, nervous system protection, excuse me, and also the TGF-beta. But the cool part is it suppresses your um, B cell and T cell proliferation in autoimmune models. And we know that there's a huge autoimmune component that kind of develops as a result of uh, mycotoxicosis. Um, and it also helps to kind of suppress micro, microglial activation too, which is great for the nervous system. So for people listening, LDN is low dose naltrexone. Um, scutellaria is another one that seems to be popular these days. Any thoughts on scutellaria for helping with this inflammatory process? Sure. Scutellaria is great for that process too. Um, And then we see a lot of support too around, um, you know, melatonin and berberine. So it's, there's a lot of opportunities out there for inflammation modulation with safe things that have minimal side effects. And lots of other good things that probably happen with those as well, beyond the ones that we're just trying to directly address. So let's talk a little about exogenous glutathione. So what are your thoughts on, is there benefit to taking glutathione um, or do we potentially then kind of shut down our own production of glutathione? And is it true that people with SIRS are generally deficient in glutathione? Right. So that's a, that's a really great question. There's a lot of different schools of thought uh, surrounding glutathione right now in the, the mold illness community. We know that the research shows us in animal mouse models that TGF beta depletes glutathione by about 50 to 80 percent. Wow. In that, yeah. So if we know that TGF beta is doing that, I don't feel comfortable withholding something that could help someone on that front. And when we start thinking about, you know, exogenous supplementation of things, I, in my training, I am more aware of exogenous supplementation with uh, hormones um, and with potential um, proteins. So your your like enzymatic proteins. Um, So for example, maybe like estrogen and amylase or something like that. I'm more of, I've had more experience in seeing those or having a concern about those being suppressed as a result of exogenous supplementation. But I, I'm not worried about that with glutathione. And why am I going to withhold something from someone that might help them um, if they're already not making enough of it? I just, I'm not worried about it. One of the common issues that people in SIRS have is this drinking a lot, peeing a lot, and still being dehydrated. So how do you support the ADH or antidiuretic hormone side of things and support hydration? Um, Vasopressin or desmopressin, not everybody seems to tolerate. So are there some other things that potentially can support that hydration aspect of SIRS? Yeah, so I think that um, there's there's quite a few things out there that can be um, helpful, but... (sighs) The most helpful one that I've seen is really berberine because we can take that on a day-to-day basis. A lot of the other interventions tend to be something that only lasts for the period of time. So, um, you know, sauna therapy um, and essentially heat applications tend to help 
with your ADH levels, but I believe it's really only for um, maybe about a half an hour to an hour afterwards. So um, some of the things that uh, we discussed do have the ADH support. And the one that really comes to mind for me right now is the berberine. Beautiful. Another common issue that people talk about in SIRS quite often is this whole idea of Marcons. I mean, it's talked about. Um, I have not personally heard a lot of people that throughout their entire journey said, oh my gosh, when I treated Marcons, I turned a corner. So I'm kind of interested in your thoughts on Marcons. Should it be treated? Should it be treated with antimicrobials or maybe with beneficial flora to kind of support the microbiome of the sinuses? Can we get rid of it knowing that it's in cavitations and root canals and other things? And does it lead your patients to higher ground? Right. So with Marcon's, yeah, there's, there are times where I have um, chased Marcon's and to no avail. There are times where I've completely cleared someone and got their lab parameters great. And then we had Marcon's hop back on and wasn't too much of an issue. I think that with Marcon's, um, you know, we, we do worry about the uphill battle of degrading MSH before we can get, you know, get it going and up and off the ground. Um, it's becoming more and more resistant. We're seeing, um, we just don't use beg spray anymore for folks. And um, silver and EDTA, um, we're also starting to we don't see resistance to silver because we're not um, specifically testing silver resistance when we do this, if people are familiar with the test. Um, but we're seeing that it's not helping to clear it as much. So, you know, we're, we're also just trying to figure out how to navigate that. And we know that when we think about the gut, we've turned a corner there and we've started using probiotics as treatment for gut imbalances. So why not try that in the nose? So a lot of people will start using um, a strain specifically called lactobacillus um, sakii, yeah. which is uh, from uh, kimchi. And I think you can get it on Amazon and people will do nasal washes with that. Um, have I seen that make a drastic difference with MSH? You know, not not to my ability, but I have seen shifts in sinus pressure and sinus pain and things along those lines. And there are now two two companies that make that available in the U.S. Um, I know Lacto Health has one called Lacto Sinus, and I believe the other is Naso Bio. If I remember correctly, yeah. so so at least yeah. that's becoming more available. Um, I know one of the reasons that people often will approach the Marcon's piece is that in the protocol, it is one of the things that you want to clear before you move on to VIP. So let's talk about VIP. What's your experience been with VIP? Do you use it in practice? What is it? Do patients tolerate it? And and how often does it ultimately become one of the top interventions for someone? Sure. So uh, VIP is vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. And um, for people who might not be as familiar with it, I tell people that it, it gets everything juicy. It gets you secreting all these things that you weren't necessarily secreting originally. Um, it helps with your fluid balance. It's supposedly this master hormone for, um, you know, MSH and a lot of the other things, your ADH that causes a thirst issue and your MSH, which controls your sleep, sex hormones and happy feelings and all this kind of stuff. So um, with VIP, it the protocol itself can be limiting to who can get a hold of it. Um, there's a lot of tight controls around implementing VIP. Um, so far with my clients, I have seen improvements in cognitive complaints, but some of the harder ones with VIP to see improvement in is the chronic pain piece. Um, unfortunately, that is something that I wish um, had better efficacy for folks. Right now, we are working around playing with um, synapse and, and a few other things that might help um, with uh, neuronal health um, that might be a better replacement for VIP. And unfortunately, because of the recent FDA hearings, sometime in the future, and this has been the standing for a while, but we've had a little update, we might be losing uh, VIP to the no compounding list and actually along with silver. So there will be some changes coming up on the horizon to some of these protocols. Yeah, synapsin is an interesting one. And then is RG3 the same as synapsin or is that a slightly different compound? Good question. So RG3 is the um, extract where I believe synapsin has the um, B 
be components added into it. Um, and I know that uh, some forms of cement, like because it's it's copyrighted or patented or something. So mm-hmm. I think there's different versions of it available, but synapsin is specifically the RG3. And then I believe some type of cobalamin every now and then you'll see B6 make an appearance in there depending on the compounding pharmacy. And have, you, have you had patients yet that have benefited from either of those? Um, so I have had some patients benefit from the synapsin. Yes, absolutely. Um, a lot around the brain fog. Um, and you know, I have had some patients benefit from VIP, but, um, really tight treatment parameters, um, which is fine. And then, um, you know, so it gets expensive or it's hard to tolerate or, um, you know, there's a whole slew of different reasons or sometimes it's just not the match, not the treatment intervention for them. Mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance, those are common issues in my observation and people dealing Mm -hmm. with SIRS and related chronic conditions. So what do you find as kind of the primary triggers for mast cell and histamine issues? And what are some of your favorite approaches for supporting those reactions while you're addressing the underlying triggers that might be actually the, the cause of them? Anyone who you speak to who has mast cell activation syndrome um, or like a histamine overload, whatever, you know, people are deciding to call it, but I call it MCAS rather than histamine overload. um, They'll tell you anything triggers them. They can look at a cat and it triggers them. They can be driving in a car and have to jam on the brakes and it triggers them. Um, They could drink water. I hear that all the time. I can't drink water without having a flare. So, you know, that that's going to that's going to really vary from person to person. The initial trigger um, that I see that kind of gets the ball rolling for people, I I really think it's one of those concepts of how how full is your cup when you hit that last um, component that's going to cause you to overflow. So once again, that could really be anything for anyone. Um, Now, when it comes to some of my favorite approaches, I just for simplicity's sake, I really like starting with an H1 blocker. So something like a Benadryl and please always get dye free. If you go to certain uh, pharmacies over the counter, look on the bottom shelf and that's usually where you'll find the dye free. Don't get the neon pink. And uh, typically we'll do Benadryl. We'll see how they go. Okay. What's happened there? Not a big impact. Okay. Then maybe we'll bring on an H2 blocker in addition. And that can tend to um, help some more of the neurological piece for people, some more of the brain inflammation piece with the histamine. Um, But I get nervous around some of the stomach issues that that can cause for folks and digestive issues. Um, And then, you know, if we really need to feel like we have to go to a level of doing compounding um, and seeing what people have financially available, then we'll talk about chromalin sodium or catodipin. Right. So let's talk then a little more about probiotics and the microbiome. We know that some probiotics can be a problem for people that are dealing with mast cell and histamine issues Mm -hmm. in that it actually promotes histamine. So how do you navigate Mm -hmm. that? And then is there a role for probiotics even in detoxifying a person from mycotoxins? Sure. So um, in general, lactobacillus casei, that is the um, strain. I don't have the specific number of the one that was um, looked at, but I know casei tends to cause some issues for people with mast cell um, activation syndrome and histamine overload, histamine intolerance. Um, With the other um, uh, probiotics that seem to be beneficial, lactobacillus casei is beneficial for mycotoxin degradation, but you walk that fine line. Perhaps more safe ones for people would be uh, lactobacillus planetarium or raminosis. And then, of course, there's uh, Saccharomyces boulardiae. And this is kind of where the the fun creative part comes in with uh, doing some of the urine mycotoxin testing is we know that Saccharomyces boulardii is great for ochratoxin, whereas we know that the plantarum and raminosis are good for aflatoxin. Beautiful. When someone is treating and suddenly they feel worse, possibly from either a detox reaction or Herxheimer reaction, what are some of the things that you put in their emergency toolbox to bring them some relief? Sure. So before before we start going around the concept of herxing and we in naturopathic medicine, we have a, a big love hate relationship with the healing crisis. And I think a lot of people get excited about people getting worse before getting better, but our healing crisis that we see with these 
really sick folks are a lot different from the healing crisis of like our founding forefathers where maybe a rash would pop up versus um, someone having severe shortness of breath and, you know, having a Bell's palsy flare on their face from their Lyme. Like you always have to be careful about the concept of um, herxing versus an exacerbation versus um, a different comorbidity popping up and you don't know the difference until after it's passed. With that being said, if I feel that someone is kind of almost usually know it's a herxing picture, if it's flu, fluy feeling, you know, like maybe worse myalgia, headache, really fatigue, not feeling too great. Um, then I'll typically um, suggest um, working with uh, phosphatidylcholine. So making sure that we're flowing getting them maybe on an H1, H2 blocker. If they know that's one of their tools, definitely throwing them on a binder to see if we can't bind some of that stuff up. Um, CoQ10. And then people, some people really like coffee enemas. Some people really like the Alka-Seltzer gold. Um, I say go for it. I know that personally for me, green juice saves my butt whenever I have a flare. Um, so I think that there also comes to be people um, knowing what their tool is. And coffee enemas, I think uh, they're definitely one of the things that help me the most. And it's also helpful from a perspective of the bile flow that we talked about as well, right? Mm -hmm. Coffee enemas can really kind of help support that bile flow and optimize the, the potential of the binders to actually be able to, to bind onto some things. How commonly right. do you see and explore chronic infections in someone with SIRS or mold illness? Do you find parasites and fungal issues and viral issues and even Lyme mm -hmm. disease and co-infections? I mean, is that something you commonly have to look at as well? And then how do you approach testing and treating those issues when they are present? Sure. So I, I do bring that up with folks. I do. Absolutely. I let them know that, you know, you can have more than one thing wrong with you. You can have more than uh, one, one issue um, leading to your overall um, health problems. So I'm very lucky in New England. Um, we have Horowitz here. We have the Stram Center. We have Dr. Alexis Chesney here in Vermont. Um, so a lot of these people who come to me already, they have seen some of the best of the best. So when it comes to Lyme and co-infections, that's always nice to see. Do I investigate it with people who don't already have those wonderful team care on board? Yeah, absolutely. And some of the other ones I definitely throw in there are looking at um, EBV, CMV, Coxsackie, um, you know, and then digging down into parasites. Parasites are a little bit harder. Every now and then someone will bring in a, a fun jar or a concerning jar, however you want to look at it. Um, but there are a lot of issues around parasites that we just don't, um, we have trouble collecting them. We have trouble seeing them. Um, you know, maybe uh, testing um, shows a false negative. And to be frank, I'm sorry, what lab technician wants to spend numerous hours digging around through poop to try to identify something? I really think that because of the nature of the substance, we lose a lot of the identification there. Um, so parasites are something that I really like working with for people. And um, there's a couple of cases that I have where, you know, um, their, their MCAS really started to shift once we treated EBV or once we treated a parasitic infection with, you know, a really thorough, well-rounded pharmaceutical parasitic mm -hmm. intervention. You mentioned DNRS earlier, the dynamic neural retraining system. There's also the Gupta amygdala program. Um, have mm -hmm. those systems of limbic system retraining been beneficial in your patients? And how might kind of focusing on that limbic system, um, which does include the hypothalamus, how might that support our recovery from something like SIRS? Sure. So kind of taking it back in general for any of your listeners who are familiar with um, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, the base in the triangle of the hierarchy of needs is, you know, food, shelter. And then as we go up, we have more of our, our, um, more of our levels of needs being met. So socialization and love and respect. And then, you know, at the top we have like meaning in life. All of that, as far as I'm concerned, kind of fits into the DNRS picture. So I might be able to go in and clean up your system and bring down inflammation, but we need to tell your body that you're okay 
and you're safe. Your body is reacting in such a way because it's trying to protect you. It's trying to um, help make a decision before you so you don't have to think about it. So when we get to take these um, fight or flight reactions offline and we can get someone back to their their flowing baseline, it, it really makes a huge difference. So whenever I have someone come in and they're already saying, I'm going to do one of these um, trainings or I'm going to go this weekend or I'm going to get the DVD or I'm going to go through this. I, hallelujah. <laughs> like, I am thankful. And a lot of people are sick enough that when I do mention it, they, they say, yes, absolutely. I'll do anything. So, um, you know, and when we work around the limbic system too, there's the potential for ADH correction. Um, ADH is highly associated with the limbic system. So I also have a little bit of my own suspicions of maybe if we don't have like berberine or some of the other things helping to improve that ADH level, maybe we can bring that into balance through some limbic system support. So we've talked about a lot of things in the last hour. Are there any other top interventions, some of your favorite things that you fairly consistently find beneficial for your patients? Sure. You know, I... A lot of the things we already went over for sure. Um, but then I am a huge believer that everyone needs to talk and everyone needs unconditional positive support. I come from a mental health background. My father's a psychologist. My, my wonderful sister is a, a LICSW. And so there are so many times where people are put into these positions where their, their loved ones don't believe them or their kids don't understand or something along those lines. So I'm a huge believer that people need that talk therapy and that support. And there's a huge stigma around mental health in our, our world. And it's just something that I think that people need to have as a base level intervention. And of course, along with that, we see a lot of um, neurological improvements in general, thanks to the work of Mary Ackerley um, around just having socialization and things like sleep, love, laughter, fear reduction, all of these wonderful um, things that we go missing when we're just focusing on biochemistry and detox and all that kind of stuff. So um, being a socialized human, we're social beings, mm -hmm. bringing that to light is really a big part of um, another intervention that I find helpful. So you are a board member of ICI. So tell us a little about ICI and the benefits of connecting with ICI for people that are really dealing with these environmentally acquired conditions. Sure. So ICI, so the International Society of Environmentally Acquired Illness, we are a nonprofit medical society. And essentially our goal is to raise awareness and have training for physicians um, around inflammatory cases of environmentally cause diseases. And so we're looking at everything from Lyme, chronic infections, to heavy metals, to mold, um, water damage buildings. And we actually have a really amazing group of folks who are on board with us. Everyone from uh, Jill Carnahan to Neil Nathan to Mary Ackerley to Sonia Rappaport. I mean, I know I'm missing so many. These are, lovely these are all, my, all my heroes now. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're very, very lucky. And then we have all these wonderful um, members who are joining every day who get it. They get it and they're there to help. So um, as time marches forward, um, we will be having certification um, where we're in the process of working through that. Um, but we do have a phenomenal conference coming up in May. And we're going to have um, Navio there. We're going to have Klinghart there. We're going to have Patricia Kane there. Um, Gosh, uh, Mary Ackerley will be speaking. Um, Burscano. Yes, confirmed Burscano. So we're, we're over the moon. We're so excited. And um, Neil Nathan's going to be talking. So we would love to see, see people there too. So. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm excited about that event. I will definitely be there as well because some of my favorite people are going to be in the room there. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. What are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Sure. That's, that's a great question. That's always, always the final question, right? Um, it's changed for me recently. Um, I am pregnant, so my current interventions are far different than what they were uh, months ago. Um, in general, I am a, a big fan of just um, doing some detoxification. I'm a big fan of NAC. I will always be a big fan of NAC. It's a biofilm buster. It helps your fluids flow, helps all that kind of stuff. 
Um, green juice is another big one. And in general, I prefer keto diet for people if they're able to tolerate it. So, um, you know, in post current pregnancy, it's kind of hands off, lots of water, lots of vegetables, lots of rest. So Beautiful. This has been so fun. Such good information that you shared with us. I appreciate you taking time today. I appreciate the work that you're doing. I'm excited about ICI. I'm really happy to see that group coming together because I know there's going to be some really great things that come out of the work that you're doing and the collaborations there with some really bright minds. So thank you so much for being here today and for all the work you're doing to help those people that are still dealing with a condition like chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Of course, Scott. And thank you for all that you do to, um, Bring, bring your audience in contact with providers who are looking to support them and share wonderful knowledge. So thank you. To learn more about today's guest, visit lifeaftermold.com. That's lifeaftermold.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.